The individual recognized throughout history as Robert Oppenheimer was born in New York City on April 22, 1904, under the given name Julius Robert Oppenheimer. Subsequently, his middle name came to be the predominant designation by which he is still commonly known today, J. Robert Oppenheimer. The Oppenheimer, Robert, Robert was born in New York City to a prosperous Jewish family. Julius, his father, was born in the Hesse-Nassau province, which was then part of the Kingdom of Prussia and later the United Kingdom of Germany, several months before Julius himself was born in May 1871. During a period of escalating anti-Semitism in Western and Central Europe, Julius Oppenheimer, then 17 years old, departed Germany for the United States in 1888. Despite being nearly destitute, he achieved success in the United States and had ascended to the position of affluent executive at one of Manhattan's foremost textile manufacturers by the time Robert was born in 1904. Robert's mother, Ella Friedman, was also of Jewish descent. She was born in New York in 1870 to a German-Jewish family that had emigrated to the United States a generation prior to Julius Oppenheimer. Robert derived a number of his aesthetic perspectives regarding the universe and the structure of existence from her, who was a painter. Ella and Julius would have one more child, a boy named Frank born in 1912, eight years after Robert. Frank would pursue a career in physics, just as his older brother had done. Robert was privileged during his youth. His father had amassed a considerable reputation in New York business circles by the mid-1900s. During the early 1910s, the family relocated to a spacious apartment situated on West 88th Street in Manhattan, which offered a view of the Central Park Reservoir and was situated in a highly prosperous neighborhood of the city. The walls of the family's residence featured original artworks by Pablo Picasso and Vincent van Gogh, among others. Prior to the turn of the 20th century, Robert attended the Alcuin Preparatory School and the Ethical Culture School, two of the finest educational institutions in New York. His German grandfather bequeathed him an interest in mineralogy, which he developed by the age of five. Due to his exceptional aptitude, he was granted membership in the Mineralogical Club of New York City at the tender age of 11. His early development continued into his secondary school years, and he completed his education at Alcuin in a year and a half ahead of schedule, having completed the eighth grade through accelerated coursework and two grade levels in 12 months. His interests had shifted from mineralogy to the more difficult sciences, specifically chemistry, by this time. However, it was physics that would ultimately fulfill his calling in the years to come. At the age of 18, Oppenheimer commenced his academic pursuits at Harvard University in 1922. Robert, who had originally intended to pursue a career in chemistry, quickly shifted his focus to physics. Nevertheless, his eclectic curiosity and initial fascination with chemistry would prove to be advantageous in his later years, particularly as scientists became overly specialized in particular fields. During his time as a student at the oldest college in America, his education was profoundly impacted by the lectures of Professor Percy Bridgman, who at the time was an experimental physicist affiliated with Harvard. During this time, scholars from prestigious American universities such as Harvard and Oppenheimer continued to explore a broad spectrum of disciplines. Historical research and the study of Greek and Latin classics remained fundamental components of many Western curricula in the 1920s. Later in life, Oppenheimer reflected on his years at Harvard and remarked that he read voraciously and spent the majority of his time in the library. He attended classes in excess of what was required of him. As a consequence, in 1925, Oppenheimer successfully completed his Bachelor of Arts program at Harvard in three years, earning a distinction that had previously required four years to achieve. However, in accordance with an emerging trend, Oppenheimer managed to complete the program in less time than the conventional duration. Oppenheimer had been granted admission to Cambridge University in England, well in advance of his Harvard graduation. This location was the preeminent hub for physics research in Britain during that era, and it has maintained and developed this reputation ever since the tenure of Isaac Newton there in the late 17th century. 
During his tenure at Cambridge from the autumn of 1925 to the summer of 1926, Oppenheimer was exposed to the teachings of Lord Ernest Rutherford, a physicist of New Zealand origin who is widely regarded as the father of nuclear physics. This year significantly impacted his development. For example, Rutherford was the first to identify and explain nuclear half-life and the associated radiation. For this accomplishment, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1908. Oppenheimer, whose prowess was beginning to garner significant interest among European physicists, accepted an offer from German physicist Max Born to study under him at the University of Göttingen in Germany, one of Europe's preeminent centers of learning, near the end of his first year at Cambridge. There, Oppenheimer engaged in studies alongside several contemporaries who would later become prominent figures in the field of theoretical physics in the 20th century. Notably, Werner Heisenberg, Enrico Fermi, and Edward Teller were among them. During the Manhattan Project, which took place in the midst of World War II, Oppenheimer collaborated with several of these individuals. It is noteworthy that Oppenheimer received his doctorate in physics in the spring of 1927, which was under a year subsequent to his arrival in Göttingen. James Frank, the internal examiner and a Nobel Prize laureate in physics from 1925, is rumored to have remarked with elation at the conclusion of the Viva Voci, or oral examination, that Oppenheimer had satisfactorily defended his doctoral work and appeared prepared to be questioned by Frank. A 1927 paper he and Born co-authored on the quantum theory of molecules that introduced the Born-Oppenheimer approximation epitomized the great promise that Oppenheimer displayed as a theoretical physicist when he received his PhD around the time he turned 23. This paper most eloquently demonstrated his potential. This relates to molecular dynamics, which is the study of the motion and interaction of molecules. Due to the significantly greater mass of nuclei in comparison to electrons, the wave functions of these components within a molecule are dissimilar, as demonstrated by Born and Oppenheimer's approximation. This implies that the coordinates of the nuclei remain relatively constant, while the lighter electrons experience a more pronounced influence from wave functions, resulting in more dynamic coordinates. The approximation achieved by the pair can be largely attributed to Oppenheimer's dual pursuits in chemistry and physics, as the theory they proposed incorporated components from both molecular and quantum physics. Practically speaking, the approximation was crucial in enabling scientists to distinguish the motion of nuclei and electrons beginning in the late 1920s. The figurehead who collaborated with Max Born on this endeavor and earned his doctorate from Göttingen was an enigmatic individual. Oppenheimer demonstrated a complex personality that fused elements of a reclusive scientist and a comparatively light-hearted persona, fluctuating between introversion and extroversion in response to the circumstances or his emotional state. Due to his habit of chain-smoking, he was constantly enveloped in a thick cloud of smoke for the majority of his adult life. This behavior significantly contributed to his untimely demise in his early 60s. Those who were acquainted with him during his time at Harvard, Cambridge, and Göttingen recollected an individual who exhibited an odd combination of intelligence and a startling naivete, frequently erring in judgment and decision-making and prone to exaggeration. Over time, he developed a tendency toward arrogance. However, this was mitigated by his intellectual magnanimity towards those who worked and studied under him, as well as those whom he later instructed. His fascination with Eastern philosophy and mysticism, especially Hinduism and Confucianism, was a notable feature of his character. He even made the effort to learn Sanskrit, the sacred language of Hinduism, in order to be able to read the ancient texts of this faith in their original form. This fascination with mysticism and religion was not an eccentric pastime. Oppenheimer regarded the study of physics as a gateway to comprehending the enigmatic essence of the universe and existence. In contrast to his pursuit of empirical scientific evidence, his overarching intellectual perspective was characterized by insatiable curiosity. Oppenheimer did, nevertheless, possess a fragmented and capricious aspect. His conduct at Harvard was occasionally scrutinized by his peers and instructors. Before departing for vacation in France in 1926, 
He allegedly doused an apple with chemicals that induce illness while attending Cambridge. He then abandoned the apple in the office of his tutor, Patrick Blackett, with whom he had a tumultuous history. It appears that this action, and possibly others as well, resulted in a brief threat of academic suspension from Cambridge. Francis Ferguson, an esteemed theorist of drama and stage performance who was a close friend of Oppenheimer in the 1920s, asserted that he was once assaulted and attempted to strangle him after Oppenheimer announced his engagement to be married. Deep insecure, according to the conclusions of a number of biographers, was the individual who lurked beneath this erratic conduct. Throughout the years, he had strained relationships with a great number of colleagues due to his abhorrent arrogance. This may have originated from the fact that Oppenheimer was the progeny of a German-Jewish émigré to America during a period of widespread anti-Semitism in the West. At the very least, he perceived himself as a perpetual outsider, and he is reputed to have experienced recurrent episodes of depression. Simply put, he constituted something of an enigma. Upon the culmination of his academic pursuits at Göttingen and the subsequent publication of numerous papers derived from his research conducted in England and Germany, Oppenheimer resettled back in the United States. During this period, he held brief fellowships at Harvard and the California Institute of Technology, interspersed with revisitations to Europe, where he spent a few months conducting research at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands and at Zurich in Switzerland both of which were sites associated with Albert Einstein's earliest and most influential investigations. The nickname, Oppie, was coinciding with a borderlerized Dutch rendering of his name that he acquired in Leiden. Oppenheimer did not return to the United States permanently until 1929, despite receiving numerous job offers from universities in the country. He accepted two offers and was appointed an associate professor of physics at the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, and the University of California, Berkeley. Over the subsequent 13 years, from 1929 to 1942, he held positions at both institutions, lecturing at Caltech in Pasadena during the spring term after teaching at Berkeley during the fall and winter semesters. In the 1930s, Oppenheimer's teaching methods gained widespread recognition in the American physics community. As a result, the most distinguished physicists of the mid-20th century in America received their education from him at the School of Theoretical Physics, which he established at Berkeley and Caltech. A cohort of approximately 12 advanced graduate students and research fellows comprised this group, and they collaborated closely with Oppenheimer on some of the most pressing issues in theoretical physics at the time. They would frequently meet on a daily basis during the busiest times of the term, during which Oppenheimer would assess their progress and provide suggestions. According to subsequent testimonies from biographers who were acquainted with him during that era, he primarily motivated his students by instilling in them the conviction that they were at the vanguard of addressing critical inquiries that confronted humanity at the time. However, the academic atmosphere was diverse, and when not debating physics, Oppenheimer and his peers were frequently observed studying Sanskrit or reading Plato in his original Greek. Later, Hans Bertha, who knew Oppenheimer during these years, recalled that Robert was largely isolated from the rest of the world in California during the late 1920s and 1930s. He did not learn of the 1929 Wall Street crash until months after it had occurred. Oppenheimer and his students achieved noteworthy scientific advancements at Caltech and Berkeley during the 1930s. For example, in 1930, Oppenheimer published a paper that accurately predicted the existence of the positron or anti-electron as an electron antiparticle. However, Carl David Anderson, a Caltech student who worked with Oppenheimer at the time, did not definitively establish its existence until 1932. Subsequently, Oppenheimer and Wendell Furry collaborated closely to deduce the modern form of the electron-positron theory and the manner in which the two concepts interacted. A monumental collaboration with Melba Phillips, one of Oppenheimer's first doctoral students during a time when women physicists were far too uncommon in the United States, was perhaps his most significant contribution. In 1935, they jointly introduced the Oppenheimer-Phillips process, 
a deuteron-induced nuclear reaction wherein the neutron component of a deuteron amalgamates with a target nucleus, resulting in the expulsion of a proton. This demonstrated that deuterons can induce radioactivity in certain elements and that nuclear interactions can take place at energies lower than was previously believed. Midway through the 20th century, this and numerous other innovations by Oppenheimer and his students at Berkeley and Caltech elevated California to the status of one of the preeminent centers of theoretical physics on a global scale. During this time, Oppenheimer's personal life was somewhat chaotic. In the years that followed his mild tuberculosis diagnosis in the late 1920s, he purchased a ranch in New Mexico and sought refuge in the arid desert climates of Arizona and New Mexico to treat the disease. During the mid-1930s, he initiated a romantic association with Jean Tatlock, a psychiatry student and the progeny of John Strong Tatlock, a distinguished Old English scholar and authority on Geoffrey Chaucer's life and works. Jean, who was ten years younger than Robert, was a young woman grappling with profound depression and a torn sexual orientation. Despite Oppenheimer's involvement with Kitty Harrison, a physicist and botanist at Caltech who ultimately divorced her second husband, Stuart Harrison, in November 1940 and wed Robert the following day, their turbulent relationship persisted until 1940. It is still unknown whether Oppenheimer maintained sporadic encounters with Tatlock during the early 1940s prior to her demise in January 1944. Subsequently, Robert and Kitty welcomed two children into their union, a son named Peter, born in May 1941, Kitty was already pregnant at the time of their nuptials, and a daughter named Catherine, named after her mother, born in 1944. Oppenheimer's life, along with that of virtually every individual in North America, Europe, North Africa, and much of Asia, was profoundly disrupted by the outbreak of the Second World War in the autumn of 1939. The outbreak of the conflict was an immediate consequence of the Nazis' rise to power in Germany in 1933, under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. The Nazis, an ardently anti-Semitic nationalist and fascist organization, had two objectives, exterminate the Jewish population in Germany and instigate a fresh conflict in Europe in order to nullify the provisions of the Treaty of Versailles, which had terminated the First World War and establish a Third Reich or Empire of Germany that would dominate the continent. Oppenheimer possessed extensive knowledge of the Nazis. Although not practicing Judaism, he entered politics for the first time in the middle of the 1930s when he began reserving 3% of his salary to assist German Jews attempting to escape the country in the wake of the anti-Jewish Nuremberg laws, which went into effect in 1934. The Nazis' anti-Jewish policies escalated significantly in 1938, especially in light of Germany's annexation of neighboring states, beginning with Austria and then Czechoslovakia, beginning in 1936. Britain and France declared war on Germany in September 1939, following the invasion of Poland, but American public opinion was not yet entirely in favor of intervention in what was considered a European conflict. As a result, the United States maintained an official neutral stance during the initial two years of the conflict, despite the fact that the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration had been furnishing Britain with substantial military supplies since the onset of the war. The occurrences of December 1941 would permanently alter Oppenheimer's life and position in history. During that period, the United States maintained its neutrality in the Second World War, notwithstanding the dire circumstances in Europe. The Nazis had already taken control of Poland in autumn 1939, Denmark and Norway the following spring, and the Low Countries and France in summer 1940. As invasions of British colonies in North Africa and Russia commenced in the summer of 1941 and numerous states, including Italy, Hungary, and Romania, allied with the Nazis, it appeared that Germany was destined to dominate Europe. Within this framework, the Empire of Japan, an ultra-nationalist nation determined to establish an empire spanning Asia and the Pacific, which by the early 1940s had already encompassed a significant portion of eastern China, Korea, and Manchuria, decided to attack the United States preemptively without officially declaring war. 
the 7th of December 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and other American territories including the Philippines sparked World War II in the United States. The United States, Germany, Italy, and the other Axis states were all involved in a conflict that engulfed the entire Northern Hemisphere within days. Oppenheimer was expeditiously elevated to the vanguard of American research endeavors amidst the conflict. This transpired within the framework of Nazi Germany's endeavors to procure a weapon of mass destruction in order to expedite its victory in the war. Germany, which was home to some of the world's foremost scientists during the 1920s and 1930s, was therefore in an ideal position to develop a nuclear weapon. In 1938, for instance, a group in Berlin led by Otto Robert Frisch and Lise Meitner discovered nuclear fission. The following year, the Nazis initiated numerous experiments in an effort to start utilizing this breakthrough in order to create a nuclear weapon. Some of these projects were devoted to the development of a nuclear reactor, whereas others advocated the use of heavy water to create an atomic weapon. These investigations were conducted in Norway, which was occupied by the Nazis during the war. Already in August 1939, at Washington, D.C., was President Roosevelt. Leo Szilard and Albert Einstein, two Hungarian nuclear physicists, had written to inform the United States government of the dangers posed by these Nazi experiments. In 1939 and 1940, there was a lack of significant endeavor to address this matter. However, following the United States' entry into the war in late 1941, there was renewed contemplation regarding the initiation of domestic research in this field. Although Oppenheimer held the official position of overseeing the Los Alamos laboratory throughout the Second World War, this operational domain was essentially subordinate to the Manhattan Project, an American government-initiated research and development initiative that commenced in 1942 with the supreme objective of fabricating a nuclear weapon. The nomenclature derives from the fact that the group of individuals tasked with overseeing the broader undertaking established their initial headquarters on the island of Manhattan in New York City in 1942. Eventually, beginning in 1942, it expanded to employ around 130,000 individuals nationwide. They labored on diverse components of the undertaking across numerous states and regions. The first operational nuclear reactor was constructed in Chicago during the war by a large team that included Enrico Fermi, an Oppenheimer associate from Göttingen, and Leo Szilard, a co-author of the letter to Roosevelt in 1939 that cautioned him about the Nazi nuclear program. An additional team was tasked with producing plutonium from uranium as a raw material for any future nuclear weapon at the Hanford site in Washington state. A comparable endeavor was also in progress in Tennessee. Even in Europe, teams of individuals conducting espionage under the auspices of the Manhattan Project attempted to discover what the Nazis were developing. Director of the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico, Oppenheimer would supervise the most vital research group among all participants in the Manhattan Project. He was on the verge of not being selected for this position. The Manhattan Project was under the supervision of Major General Leslie Groves. Although Groves may not be universally recognized today, he did preside over the Manhattan Project, which resulted in the development of the first nuclear weapon, and the Pentagon, which currently serves as the administrative and military headquarters of the United States Department of Defense. Groves was initially skeptical of Oppenheimer's suitability to lead a team of scientists and theoretical physicists working on the Manhattan Project in 1942. Groves preferred the appointment of a Nobel Prize laureate, who possessed the requisite academic prestige and expertise to guide a group comprising some of the most distinguished minds of the era. Ultimately, he was convinced that Oppenheimer had a history of eliciting optimal performance from those with whom he collaborated. Following an interview, he reached out to Oppenheimer and determined that he was highly qualified for the position. During the subsequent weeks in early winter 1942, Oppenheimer conducted reconnaissance to identify a viable site for the construction of a research facility, in a remote area separate from urban centers, where confidentiality could be maintained and eventual nuclear weapon tests could take place. In New Mexico's Los Alamos, 
where a research facility was constructed on the site of an abandoned school, he ultimately established residence. This was subcontracted to the University of California via the War Department in order to grant Oppenheimer a certain level of independence in the process of appointing and dismissing the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory. However, more individuals would be hired than fired. During its peak, Los Alamos employed in excess of 5,000 individuals, which was significantly more than what Oppenheimer had originally predicted. Oppenheimer assembled at Los Alamos a group of scientists who were among the most distinguished of the early 20th century. One of them was physicist and mathematician John Hasbarek van Vleck, who had already attended Harvard University prior to Oppenheimer's arrival in 1922. Following this, in 1977, he was bestowed with the Nobel Prize in recognition of his contributions to the field of electronic magnetism. Van Vleck made substantial contributions to the design of the gun that was incorporated into the Hiroshima bomb. Robert Serber, an organizing physicist at Los Alamos and a Berkeley colleague of Oppenheimer's, later named the bombs that were utilized in the initial test explosion and against Japan, Thin Man, Little Boy, and Fat Man, in reference to fictional detective characters from literature and films like the Maltese Falcon. Hans Bertha, a theoretical physicist of German descent, was subsequently honored with the Nobel Prize in 1967. His involvement in the computation of the critical mass of the bombs conceived at Los Alamos was pivotal. Edward Teller, who was ultimately recruited to the Los Alamos laboratory, was of Hungarian descent. In the late 1920s, he had pursued his studies in Germany concurrently with Oppenheimer. However, he had since relocated to the United States. Teller had prior experience working at the Fermi Reactor Center in Chicago prior to his transfer to New Mexico. At Los Alamos, Teller was arguably Oppenheimer's closest colleague. Hundreds of additional engineers, metallurgists, chemists, and military experts comprised the research teams at Los Alamos, where they labored over a vast array of more minute aspects pertaining to the construction of the first atomic weapon. The endeavor that this group comprising physicists, engineers, and scientists encountered was extremely formidable. Upon their assemblage at Los Alamos, the individuals possessed a rudimentary understanding of the theoretical mechanisms underlying the production of a nuclear chain reaction. However, in an era where the destructive consequences of a nuclear explosion are well understood, it is crucial to bear in mind that Oppenheimer and his associates at Los Alamos were not only tasked with developing a nuclear weapon, but also with forecasting its outcomes. Therefore, during the years 1943 and 1944, a tremendous amount of theoretical speculation and experimentation occurred. Throughout everything, Oppenheimer exerted tremendous effort. His uncanny speed in grasping the main points of any subject was decisive, he could familiarize himself with the essential particulars of every section of the work, Hans Bertha recalled years later. His direction was not from the headquarters. Intellectually and even physically, he was present at every decisive moment. However, his health suffered as a result of the exceedingly strenuous work schedule he maintained at Los Alamos. Although he had always been slender, he lost an additional 20 pounds while working in New Mexico, reaching a final weight of 110 pounds, less than 8 stones. Research endeavors at Los Alamos commenced in 1943 with a specific emphasis on a prototype designated as the Thin Man. This was a plutonium gun-type weapon that operated more like an artillery gun than an implosion bomb when it came to detonation. The logistical complexity of the research and development process was immense. To produce the initiator, Polonium was extracted from ores located in Ontario, Canada, and subsequently processed at either a distinct facility in Tennessee, which was an integral component of the broader Manhattan Project, or the Hanford site situated in Washington state. However, the design issue was even more complicated. For the gun-type weapon to function, a plutonium bullet fired from within the bomb must be accelerated to over 3,200 km per hour or 3,000 feet per second, otherwise, nuclear fission would commence prior to the completion of the bomb's other components, which are necessary for a successful explosion. 
The Thin Man design ultimately met its demise when it became apparent in 1944 that the gun barrel required to achieve this velocity was excessively large to function in a bomb capable of being carried by a B-29 flying superfortress, a newly designed heavy bomber designated by the United States government to transport any nuclear bomb. In April 1944, this, in conjunction with concerns regarding the utilization of plutonium in a gun-type bomb, caused the abandonment of the Thin Man design. Following the abandonment of the Thin Man design, Oppenheimer reallocated a significant number of the scientists and engineers who had been dedicated to its development to the Little Boy design. This contraption was designed as a simplified gun-type fission bomb. However, in contrast to the Thin Man, uranium-235 was deliberately selected to fuel the nuclear fission responsible for the detonation. A third type of design was being developed concurrently. Although the Fat Man utilized plutonium, it was originally engineered as an implosion-type bomb. Under the leadership of Seth Nedermeyer, an American physicist, the design team implemented the object. Oppenheimer maintained his preference for the gun-type design throughout 1943 and 1944, despite the progress being made on the Fat Man. The astuteness of Oppenheimer as a supervisor at Los Alamos was demonstrated by his choice to invite John von Neumann, a physicist and mathematician of Hungarian descent, to assess the design in Los Alamos in 1943. Von Neumann proposed the utilization of shaped charges and a spherical configuration to decrease the quantity of plutonium required and facilitate the fabrication of an implosion-type weapon. After several months of metallurgists at Los Alamos attempting to solve the problem of how to cast plutonium into spheres, this obstacle was eventually surmounted with the invention of a plutonium-gallium alloy that could be pressed into nickel-coated spheres. The design phase was approaching its culmination. Oppenheimer's teams were nearing completion of the designs for the Little Boy and Fat Man as 1945 began at Los Alamos. As a result, there existed two credible contenders capable of successfully constructing a nuclear weapon. Ultimately, both facilities were finished concurrently in the spring of 1945, as design issues were resolved and the necessary quantities of enriched uranium and plutonium were generated at their respective sites in Tennessee and Washington state. The latter endeavors were of the utmost magnitude, considering the technological capabilities at the Manhattan Project at the time. Enriching these materials to fissile status in the mid-1940s was an incredibly expensive and time-consuming process. The majority of the remaining elements that required resolution were engineering tasks. As an illustration, in 1944, the Fat Man bomb was being constructed employing an enormous assortment of around 1,500 bolts, which was an excessive quantity for the development of a functional bomb. Upon its completion in early summer 1945, the number of bolts had been reduced to a mere 90 by Oppenheimer's team. Further technical concerns revolved around the descent of the bomb when dropped from an altitude. Tests were conducted throughout 1944 and 1945 to determine how a bomb comparable in size and composition to the Fat Man and Little Boy would traverse the atmosphere. By midsummer 1945, Oppenheimer successfully apprised Major General Leslie Groves, the overseeing officer of the Manhattan Project, that all preparations had been finalized in preparation for the test detonation. On July 16, 1945, the Trinity nuclear test was conducted in the Jornada del Muerto Desert located in New Mexico. Not surprisingly, the Spanish translation of the desert's name is Dead Man's Root. In a 1962 correspondence with Groves, Oppenheimer disclosed that he codenamed the examination Trinity because, at the time, he was contemplating the religious poetry of John Donne, an English poet from the 17th century, which inspired the idea for the name. A Fat Man bomb, composed of plutonium and functioning as an implosion device, was designated for utilization in the experiment. In the course of the experiment, the bomb under consideration was designated as the gadget. To ensure the test could be conducted in a secure manner, a location that was exceedingly isolated, virtually devoid of inhabitants, and possessed no other amenities was selected. 
The proposed blast site contained a solitary structure, the McDonald Ranch House, which had been constructed by a German immigrant in 1913. The McDonald family forcibly vacated the property in 1942, subsequent to the United States government acquiring the area under the auspices of the Manhattan Project. The experiment was meticulously organized, given that the plutonium intended for use had been produced using torturous methods that cost billions of dollars in present-day currency. This reflects the severity of the procedures used to enrich uranium and plutonium during that era. Much depended on the outcome being successful, Groves remarked at the time that he was unwilling to provide a congressional committee with an explanation as to why he had purposefully detonated plutonium worth a billion dollars in the desert. The Trinity examination was conducted in the early hours of July 16, around dawn. In three distinct locations to the north, south, and west of the explosion site, each approximately nine kilometers from the location where the bomb would detonate, observation shelters were constructed. Protective goggles against ultraviolet rays were supplied, and the distance was deemed to be of sufficient safety in relation to the radioactive half-life generated. A considerable number of the observers that morning were scientists, including John von Neumann, Oppenheimer, Teller, Berta, and Enrico Fermi. There were those who held the belief that the bomb was ineffective. Others were apprehensive regarding the specific extent of destruction that it might entail. When the gadget detonated at 5.29 a.m., releasing explosive energy equivalent to 25,000 tons of TNT, they received their answers. This produced a crater with a width of one-third of a kilometer and melted the sand at the launch site, transforming it into a rock resembling light green glass. Forty seconds after the explosion, the observers situated nine kilometers away were unable to discern the tremendous noise produced by the shock wave. However, during that period, they were beholden to the development of a fireball that progressively transformed in hue from purple to orange and then to white. Subsequently, it merged into a mushroom cloud, which ultimately propelled itself 12 kilometers into the atmosphere. The impact of the explosion was perceived by individuals approximately 100 kilometers away. Conversely, those positioned in observation shelters 9 kilometers away recalled a momentary surge in intense heat, comparable to the sensation of being momentarily exposed to an open oven for a few seconds, at the time of the detonation of the bomb. The purported words spoken by Oppenheimer while observing the Trinity text explosion have gained some notoriety in contemporary times. It is purported that he cited from the Bhagavad Gita, a sacred scripture in Hinduism that was composed during the latter part of the first millennium BC and bears an approximation of the title, The Song by God. The Gita, a 700-verse scripture, is predominantly concerned with Prince Arjuna and his counsel, concerning a vast array of religious and moral issues, as provided by the Hindu deity Krishna. There exists a prevalent and erroneous notion that Oppenheimer cited a verse from the Gita wherein another Hindu deity Vishnu is depicted as saying, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. While this verse would have been an apt declaration on that particular morning in New Mexico, it is not the case that Oppenheimer actually uttered it. However, 20 years later, he reflected on the incident and stated that an alternative line from the Gita that reads, if the luminosity of a thousand suns were to flash simultaneously into the sky, that would be like the splendor of the Mighty One, was in his mind. Upon further consideration in 1965, he concluded that the other line would have been more appropriate. However, contrary to popular belief, Oppenheimer never actually uttered the words, I am transformed into death, the destroyer of worlds. Oppenheimer was jubilant, it was later noted. However, the consequences of their accomplishments would become abundantly clear in a short span of weeks. The atomic bomb would be used as a military weapon within weeks of the Trinity test explosion. The European conflict had concluded by that point, as the Allies had advanced from the east and west into Germany in the spring of 1945, resulting in Hitler's suicide in Berlin in late April and the Nazi surrender within a week. Nevertheless, the Imperial Japanese Empire had not demonstrated any inclination towards capitulation, 
and Japanese military culture and honor systems appeared to imply that an occupation of the Japanese archipelago was imperative in order to terminate the Pacific War. According to calculations by the United States government, this could lead to millions of deaths as the Japanese fought to the bitter end. As a result, an immediate determination was made to employ the newly developed atomic bomb as a means to showcase to the Japanese government the capabilities of the administration's latest weapon. This choice was made under the leadership of President Harry Truman, who assumed office in mid-April 1945 subsequent to the demise of President Roosevelt. The consequence on August 6, 1945, was the detonation of one of the little boy bombs upon the Japanese metropolis of Hiroshima. Oppenheimer, who had achieved victory at Los Alamos that evening, appeared to lament the unavailability of the weapon to employ against the Nazis in Germany. However, this anticipation was short-lived as it was replaced three days later by disappointment following the United States' delivery of a second, fat man, type bomb to the Japanese city of Nagasaki. Oppenheimer and his colleagues reached the consensus that this could not be tolerated. In any case, the Japanese were not afforded sufficient time to consider the repercussions of the initial bombing and reach a surrendering decision until six days subsequent to the bombing of Nagasaki. The war subsequently came to a close. Nuclear weapons have been employed in warfare on only two occasions in recorded history, during the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They are therefore extraordinarily contentious. Present-day analysts examining the August 1945 events are inclined to concur with Oppenheimer and his colleagues that the initial bombing of Hiroshima, which compelled the Japanese to surrender and potentially spared millions of lives by preventing a land invasion of the Japanese archipelago, was somewhat justifiable despite being immediately regrettable. However, there is widespread agreement that the bombing of Nagasaki, which occurred only three days later, was unwarranted. In a broader sense, there has been considerable scrutiny regarding the ethical ramifications of the work conducted by Oppenheimer and his colleagues during the war as part of the Manhattan Project. This issue has two distinct perspectives. The advent of nuclear weapons has presented a contemporary humanity with an existential peril. Conversely, the nuclear deterrent has maintained the peace between major powers and large states through the avoidance of major conflicts since 1945. Europe's states had been perpetually at war with one another for centuries. Everything changed when it became clear that engaging in direct conflict could lead to irreparable damage to both parties. Ironically, the development of nuclear weapons has contributed to the establishment of a nuclear peace. Nevertheless, in a 21st century world characterized by increasingly antagonistic and unstable politics, the inherent dangers continue to be substantial. Following the conclusion of the war, Oppenheimer's standing in American academic circles reached an all-time high. As a result, he made the decision to depart from Berkeley and relocate to the East Coast in 1947 in order to assume the role of director of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton in New Jersey. This prestigious institution was dedicated to the study of physics in the United States and had hosted notable figures such as Niels Bohr, Paul Dirac, Albert Einstein, and Niels Bohr as former charter members or visiting fellows. It became a hub for burgeoning physicists under the direction of Oppenheimer, and when he left Berkeley, half a dozen of his most promising graduate students followed suit and enrolled at Princeton. During his time in New Jersey, Oppenheimer refined the techniques he had established in California during the 1930s. This fostered an atmosphere of lively deliberation and investigation, frequently to the detriment of his own research, as he chose to publish and write minimally at Princeton. Later in the 1940s and early 1950s, the Institute emerged as the preeminent center for the study of physics in the United States. Several of the most influential physicists of the latter half of the 20th century attended the Institute during Oppenheimer's tenure, including Murray Gell-Mann, who won the Nobel Prize in 1969 for his research on elementary particles, and Yoichiro Nambu, a Japanese-American who was co-awarded the Nobel Prize in 2008 for his contribution to the discovery of spontaneous broken symmetry in subatomic physics. Throughout the late 1940s and into the 1950s, in addition to his work at Princeton, 
Oppenheimer held a number of government positions and possessed security clearance to view classified documents and materials pertaining to the evolving nuclear program of the United States. Significantly noteworthy was his membership in the Atomic Energy Commission, an organization that had been recently formed in 1947 under the leadership of the United Nations. The UN, itself, had established the commission with the objective of promoting global peace in the post-war period. It was the responsibility of the Energy Commission to oversee the development of nuclear weapons and the proliferation of nuclear materials. Although the United States possessed nuclear bombs exclusively for a number of years following 1945, it was only a question of time before other countries attempted to develop or construct such weapons, given that the world had witnessed that such weapons were feasible to produce. In 1946 and 1947, Oppenheimer and a number of his former Manhattan Project colleagues were instrumental in establishing restrictions on nuclear proliferation that remain in effect at present. In the context of the developing Cold War, as the first chairman of the commission, Oppenheimer attempted to dissuade the United States and the Soviet Union from engaging in a nuclear arms race. However, his endeavors were in vain, and a significant nuclear arms race ensued in 1949, subsequent to the Soviets' successful completion of their initial nuclear weapon test. Upon the United States becoming aware of the Soviet Union's attainment of a nuclear weapon in 1949, the administration of President Harry Truman was engulfed in controversy regarding the development of a hydrogen or thermonuclear bomb. This latter type of nuclear weapon would be significantly more potent than the atomic bombs that had been produced as part of the Manhattan Project and deployed against Japan in 1945. Oppenheimer, along with numerous other scientists who had labored at the Los Alamos Laboratory from 1942 to 1945, expressed opposition to the aforementioned measure. They contended that the practical implementation of such a weapon in warfare would be unfeasible, as it would inflict catastrophic destruction and have the potential to instigate a nuclear war, thereby obliterating a substantial portion of life on Earth. They argued that the proposal to develop thermonuclear weapons presented an extreme danger to humanity that completely outweighs any potential military advantage, in a petition to the government submitted in late 1949. However, Truman proceeded with the initiative and granted approval for the new program in January 1950. In November 1952, approximately three years later, the initial hydrogen bomb was tested on a Pacific Ocean atoll. The bomb, which was given the moniker Ivy Mike, detonated with an explosion that surpassed 10 million tons of TNT in strength and was 450 times more powerful than the atomic bomb that the United States dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. Notwithstanding the concerns voiced by Oppenheimer and numerous others, the Cold War was approaching an epoch characterized by mutually assured destruction. Oppenheimer, a senior government scientist who had been an integral part of the Manhattan Project for many years, ran afoul of the government during the Second Red Scare in the early 1950s. During this period, the Cold War with the Soviet Union intensified due to the partition of Germany into a communist East Germany and a Western-aligned West Germany, as well as the establishment of rival military alliances the Warsaw Pact and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The Korean War marked the first major proxy conflict between the Western and communist blocs. Amid this context, the United States was initially troubled by legitimate concerns that communist organizations operating as a fifth column for the Soviet Union within the country. However, these concerns quickly transformed into intense and unfounded paranoia regarding the intentions of individuals or organizations affiliated with socialist politics, including the American Civil Liberties Union. To differentiate it from the first Red Scare, which occurred in the United States in the late 1910s subsequent to the Russian Revolution of 1917, the Second Red Scare gained momentum in the late 1940s and peaked between 1950 and 1954, during which time Senator Joseph McCarthy made concerted endeavors to apprehend and prosecute individuals even remotely suspected of harboring communist sympathies. Subsequently, Oppenheimer encountered suspicion amidst the Second Red Scare. 
Oppenheimer's affiliations with socialist and left-wing political movements as well as civil liberties organizations in the United States date back to the mid-1930s. At that time, he had largely maintained a non-partisan stance during his youth, but gradually developed a keen interest in political matters. As a result, he became involved in several progressive and left-wing movements during a period when socialist organizations and parties were viewed as the logical antithesis to the rising fascist tide in Europe. This was especially true after 1936, when the Soviet Union and other communist parties backed the Republicans against the nationalists in the Spanish Civil War. It is important to acknowledge, Despite the fact that Oppenheimer never formally affiliated with the Communist Party of the United States, a significant number of his closest associates were active members. Among these were his wife Kitty, brother Frank, and Jean Tatlock, with whom he had a romantic involvement beginning in 1936. Additional movements in which Robert participated, including the American Civil Liberties Union, were likewise regarded as radical from the 1930s to the 1950s. However, they have since come to be recognized as the pioneers of the civil rights movement that ultimately abolished segregation after an extended period of time. The aforementioned factors contributed to the authorities' skepticism towards Oppenheimer. This was further exacerbated by the fact that his father was born in Germany during World War II. Despite the fact that this was an utter oxymoron, given that Oppenheimer's Jewish heritage would have rendered him an enemy of the Nazi regime in Berlin. However, there were widespread suspicions regarding Oppenheimer. Even during America's involvement in the Second World War, a peculiar period in which he was one of the most senior figures involved in the Manhattan Project while the FBI simultaneously had a file open on him, he was under surveillance. In 1949, Oppenheimer was compelled to provide testimony before the House Un-American Activities Committee regarding his political affiliations, as these concerns had come to a head by that time. Amidst this, he acknowledged his association with the Communist Party and disclosed that several of his most distinguished Berkeley students from the 1930s had been active members of the organization. However, he firmly maintained his non-membership status. The interrogation concluded at that moment. However, in the early winter of 1953, four years later, the allegations against Oppenheimer were revived. This time, the FBI was erroneously convinced, contrary to initial beliefs, that Oppenheimer was a Soviet asset operating within the United States. The degree of paranoia that characterized the United States during the Second Red Scare was as follows. Oppenheimer's security clearance with the United States government was revoked in mid-December 1953, after which he was advised to tender his resignation from all government positions. Oppenheimer declined this proposition and insisted on conducting a hearing, which transpired in the late spring of 1954, behind closed doors. Amidst this, Oppenheimer was profoundly undermined by his former colleague, Edward Teller, who testified that he had on occasion regarded Oppenheimer's conduct as director of the Los Alamos Laboratory as dubious. Midway through the 1950s, Oppenheimer was exiled into the political and social wilderness following the revocation of his security clearance for this betrayal. Oppenheimer experienced the years that followed his security hearing and the subsequent revocation of his security clearance as a trying period. The response from members of the academic community was varied. Although Oppenheimer was generally supported by his peers, the bureaucrats and administrators in charge of American universities were frequently less optimistic. In fact, several of them cancelled his scheduled lectures and appearances. Oppenheimer abstained from overt participation in numerous initiatives launched by figures such as Albert Einstein to warn the government and American society about the dangers of excessive nuclear proliferation after his own confidence was eroded. Conversely, he increased the duration of his absences from the United States mainland by settling in the Virgin Islands in the Caribbean, an overseas territory of the United States. Subsequently, he acquired a property on the island of St. John formerly referred to as Gibney Beach, but presently recognized colloquially as Oppenheimer Beach. From 1957 onward, he resided in this country for extended durations, 
Despite the fact that numerous American institutions and organizations continued to extend invitations for him to deliver guest lectures. In contrast, the 1950s were exceptionally slow years for his research, as he published almost nothing. Towards the end of the 1950s, concerted efforts were initiated to repatriate Oppenheimer. As an illustration, he was bestowed with the Legion d'honneur by the French government in 1957, a tribute paid to his valor during the war for the Allied cause. He was granted the status of a foreign member of the Royal Society in Britain in 1962. During that period, there was a growing domestic recognition in the United States that the prosecution of individuals who had only tenuous affiliations with the American Communist movement and had no tangible connections to the Soviet Union during the Second Red Scare had been completely unwarranted. Subsequently, in 1963, President John F. Kennedy took the initiative to restore Oppenheimer's reputation by bestowing upon him the Enrico Fermi Award, an accolade established by the U.S. Department of Energy in 1956 and bearing the name of the Italian-American scientist Enrico Fermi, who had prematurely passed away from stomach cancer in 1954 after developing the initial nuclear reactor in Chicago in 1942 as part of the Manhattan Project. Several individuals who had worked under Oppenheimer at the Los Alamos Laboratory between 1943 and 1945 were honored with the award, including von Neumann, Berta, and Teller in 1956, 1961, and 1962, respectively. Therefore, the award was belatedly presented to Oppenheimer in 1963, which was a grateful admission of the government's error in prosecuting him during the Red Scare. Poor Oppenheimer did not have the good fortune to witness a partial restoration of his reputation. In late 1965, two years subsequent to receiving the Fermi Award, he received a diagnosis of throat cancer, an ailment that was unequivocally attributed to his lifetime habit of chain smoking. During this era, numerous types of cancer that are presently curable were essentially fatal. Therefore, Despite undergoing intensive chemotherapy to extend his life expectancy, Oppenheimer lapsed into a coma in early 1967 and passed away on February 18 at his residence in Princeton. At the time, he was 62 years old. Although the bestowal of the Enrico Fermi Award in 1963 only partially restored his reputation and continued to be viewed with suspicion by many political figures, the academic community manifested its reverence for Oppenheimer through a funeral service that drew more than 600 colleagues from the military, scientific community, and academia, many of whom had collaborated with him at Los Alamos. His ashes were subsequently placed in an urn and deposited in the waters off St. John's Island in the Caribbean. Over the subsequent several decades, his reputation has been completely restored. In contrast, Edward Teller, who provided testimony against Oppenheimer during his 1954 closed-door hearing, encountered significant rejection from sections of the American scientific community that persisted for decades. Oppenheimer received his third posthumous nomination for the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1967. Despite being nominated in 1946 and 1951, as well as in 1967, he failed to receive the prestigious honor on those two occasions. Considerable scholarly interest has been devoted over the years to determining why, in light of his vast achievements, he did not receive the Nobel Prize. However, it appears that there were unambiguous justifications for his omission. To begin with, Oppenheimer's body of work was relatively limited in scope, in contrast to the prolific publication record of Albert Einstein, over 300 scientific papers during his lifetime and numerous books later on. In stark contrast, Oppenheimer's post-World War II scholarly output amounted to a mere five papers. Moreover, despite his contributions to various domains of research within the field of physics, he failed to achieve a breakthrough of sufficient magnitude in either theory or practice to merit the awarding of the Nobel Prize in any particular spot. Nobel Prizes are typically bestowed in recognition of particular scientific achievements rather than lifetimes of labor. For example, Einstein received his Nobel Prize primarily for his contributions to the study of the photoelectric effect. Therefore, it was determined that Oppenheimer's individual scientific contributions did not merit a Nobel Prize, 
although some have hypothesized that his research on gravitational collapse merited the award. His career was predominantly characterized by collaborative endeavors and supervision of physicist and other scientific teams. This quality rendered him the optimal candidate to assume leadership of the Los Alamos Laboratory throughout the duration of the war. Robert Oppenheimer is widely regarded as one of history's most influential theoretical physicists. His scholarly investigations and contributions from the 1920s to the 1960s significantly advanced our comprehension of the cosmos. Particularly noteworthy were the breakthroughs he and Melba Phillips achieved in 1935 with the Oppenheimer-Phillips process, which enabled a deuteron-induced nuclear reaction, and the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which revolutionized molecular dynamics beginning in 1927. However, his tenure as director of the Las Alamos Laboratory during the Manhattan Project will forever remain in his memory. Oppenheimer could be considered the principal physicist involved in the United States' endeavors to create an atomic bomb in this capacity throughout the Second World War. Regardless of the existential and moral ramifications that may have resulted from the introduction of such weapons into the world, it is indisputable that this research was deemed essential given the circumstances. Oppenheimer, evidently troubled by what he and his colleagues had released into the world, argued against the development of even more lethal weapons of mass destruction for the majority of the post-war period. This contributed, at least in part, to his persecution and prosecution by the government for which he had previously worked in the early 1950s, as well as his expulsion into the wilderness during the Second Red Scare. However, his legacy remains vibrant in the present day. Oppenheimer, an eccentric individual who regarded the physical universe with mysticism, is undoubtedly regarded as one of the preeminent scientists of the 20th century. What is your opinion regarding Robert Oppenheimer? Had he been the preeminent figure engaged in the Manhattan Project, would he have been deserving of the Nobel Prize? Kindly provide your feedback in the comment section. Until then, we appreciate your attention.